My dear friends and colleagues, welcome to the 17th annual fireside of the J. Ruben Clark Law Society. This fireside is being broadcast from the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, to attorney and student chapters throughout the world. We are grateful that you are with us this evening. My name is Stephen L. West, and I serve as the International Chair of the J. Ruben Clark Law Society. I am joined on the stand by others who will participate in our program and whom I will introduce shortly. We are also privileged to be joined by Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and his wife, Sister Kathy Christofferson, along with Elder Lance B. Whitman, Emeritus Member of the Seventy and General Counsel for the Church, President Kevin J. Worthen, President of Brigham Young University, and his wife Peggy are also with us this evening. We are so grateful for all of their kind and unwavering support of the Law Society. In addition, seated on the stand and with us in the audience are leaders not only of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society, but of the BYU Law Alumni Association and other leaders within the academic, business, church, and legal communities. Although we do not have time to recognize each individually, we acknowledge both their presence and their significant contributions to the Law Society, our communities, and the legal profession. We express appreciation to the Church's Satellite Committee, Audiovisual Department, and Broadcast Team for making this evening possible. We also warmly thank the Fireside Committee for their tireless work and send sincerest thanks to the BYU Law School for its ongoing support of the Law Society and of this event. Finally, we recognize that so many of you have planned events of your own in connection with this broadcast. We are grateful for your efforts and for all that our local chapter leaders and members do to advance the mission of the Law Society. Next month, the Law Society will hold its 14th annual conference in beautiful Seattle, Washington. This gathering of law students, practicing attorneys, judges, law professors, and many others is unique in its distinct acknowledgment of the strength which one's religious conviction brings to the law. If you have not already registered for the conference, please do so at jrcls.org. Our early registration deadline is February 1st, and you are urged to sign up as soon as possible. The conference promises to provide relevant and timely continuing legal education, together with singular opportunities for camaraderie, inspiration, and uplift. As we emerge into this, our 31st year, Law Society leadership is more focused than ever on six strategic objectives. These objectives include strengthening our online platforms, improving communication with and engagement of Law Society members, strengthening Law Society leadership, and continuing our efforts to promote and defend religious freedom. Our focus on these objectives is inspired by a bright hope that the influence and leadership of Law Society members will continue to expand across the world. Worthy influence is our ultimate goal. This kind of influence can only be maintained by persuasion, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, and love unfeigned. Combined with professional excellence, these virtues fuel the worthy influence so critical to the many causes, disputes, and endeavors in which those with legal training are called upon to lead. May we each this evening renew our commitment to apply that worthy influence and thereby make a difference in our homes, our professions, and in the communities in which we live and work. Our program will begin as follows. Wendy Vaudry, Chair of the University of Utah Student Chapter of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society, will offer the invocation. After the prayer, Tyler Holt and Stephen Arroyo, JD candidates at the J. Reuben Clark Law School, will favor us with Nearer My God to Thee. Following the musical number, Richard Sheffield, Chair of the Law Society's Service and Outreach Committee, will recognize this year's recipient of the Franklin S. Richards Public Service Award. We will proceed to that point. Our dear Father in Heaven, we thank Thee this day that we can gather together in this beautiful assembly hall and in the LDS Conference Center of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And we thank Thee that as a group, we are, able to, we are privileged this evening to 
listen to the wisdom of Vice President Rasband. Please bless that thy spirit will touch Vice President Rasband as he speaks and that he will have the knowledge of what is most needed. And please touch us as well as the listeners around the world that many of the questions that we have and the difficulties we face as attorneys and students in the legal field, that we can leave this conference better than we came. Please bless us that in a world, that in this world that we strive to practice, that we can be a light, that our integrity will guide us and that people will see the peace that we carry because of our religious convictions. Please help our world leaders that they also can learn civility and practice it, and that as we see them do so, that we can also emulate their example. Please help us to be wise as we elect the leaders of the world that they will emulate integrity. We are so grateful for the opportunity we have as students and as practicing attorneys. Please help us to have a spirit of teaching. And please help those that are students and new attorneys to be teachable in this, what we call a practice. And we ask these things humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
imagine with me that you're 14 years old, alone in New York City, an undocumented stranger in a foreign land with a language you cannot understand. You struggle for food, warmth, belonging, and then it happens. You're in custody on the cusp of de deportation. That's when you meet her. No, she can't erase the hurt, though her eyes say she would if she could. She speaks your language. She listens. She's going to help. Indeed, she already has, because you have two things you haven't had in a while, hope and a friend. What you don't know is she's in her busiest year of law school, and you're one of hundreds she's somehow working with. She's sacrificing weekends and taking calls in the middle of the night to meet with others just like you. Strangest thing, when you sit across from her, you feel like the only one in the world that matters to her. Fast forward many years, changing the story now. Imagine you're a seven-year-old child. Your parents took you across the border to try to give you a new, new and better life. Even if you knew English, you're too young to understand what's going on. Despite the southern heat, everything feels so cold, so wrong. You're shutting down, retracting into a shell that you might never exit. Then you meet her at the New Mexico Border Detention Center. She's giving a week of volunteer service there. Weeks like weeks that she's given over the many years from her Chicago corporate immigration practice at the massive international law firm Fragelman. She wants to help and can't bear to watch you wither, wither away. She thinks maybe, just maybe, if you and your parents are released on bond, maybe you'll start eating again. But the bond is more than your parents may make in a lifetime. The judge won't lower it, despite the statutory minimum being 20 times lower. It's the judge's baseline for bond for most everyone. Then, you, then she does something we don't see attorneys do, certainly not in open court anyway. She sobs. Those genuine tears from an overworked corporate attorney change the judge's heart. The bond is not just lowered to the statutory minimum, but that minimum becomes the judge's new baseline. Colleagues and friends, these stories hardly scratch the surface of the lifelong contributions of this year's Franklin S. Richards Public Service Award recipient, Rebecca Van Eidert. Among other things, she's established and led Fragelman Chicago's pro bono program, which focused on assisting refugees, asylum applicants, DACA students, known as DREAMers, and criminal victim applicants. She has also provided years of pro bono service to the World Relief Refugees and Immigration Services and the National Immigrant Justice Center. And in addition to these significant personal contributions, she has led and inspired scores of others to join in making a difference, including many members of the Chicago chapter of the Law Society. On behalf of the grateful members of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society, I present Rebecca Van Eidert with a small token of appreciation for what those who know her best call a hugely generous spirit, a deep commitment to her passion, and a dazzling modesty. Becca, if you would join me now. It is now my great pleasure to present the Law Society's Exemplary Leadership Award. Awesome, honor, hard worker, wise, solicitous, kind, unassuming. These are some of the words that come to mind for those who have worked closely with Jim Rasband for years. This is because he is the real deal. He really does care about others 
and he really does listen. To spend time with Jim Rasband is an exercise in self-improvement. You come away from that experience wanting to be your best self. Like other brilliant lawyers, his legal education and achievements thereafter have given him significant access to significant power and influence. But Jim has admirably resisted the impulse to exercise that power and influence in an unworthy or condescending way. His kindness, civility, patience, and collegiality are as much or more a part of his professional life as his remarkable ability to spot issues, give wise counsel, and provide sound judgments. In short, Jim works to lift and build those around him while exhibiting the highest standards of professional competence. His influence might well be symbolized by a physical change that took place at the J. Reuben Clark Law School while he served as dean. For much of the law school building's existence, students, faculty, and guests were greeted at its entry by a dark, albeit friendly, brick wall. Under Jim's visionary leadership, light now floods the law school's entry from every direction. What once looked a little like a prison now appears as a soul-expanding sanctuary. For his critical thinking and thoughtful direction while a member of the Law Society's International Board of Directors, his unique ability to help other people feel heard and relevant, his Herculean marathons of sustained effort in his many responsibilities, and his inspiring influence for good. It is my great honor to present James R. Rasband with the J. Reuben Clark Law Society's Exemplary Leadership Award. Jim, if you could please come forward. The program will now proceed as follows. Dean Gordon Smith, Dean of the J. Reuben Clark Law School, will now introduce our speaker. After Jim's remarks, Joshua Randall, International Chair-Elect of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society, will give the benediction. We invite those in attendance tonight to join us for a reception in the conference center plaza level immediately after the fireside. Please remain in your seats following the closing prayer to enjoy the postlude provided by Kate Zercher, a JD candidate at the J. Reuben Clark Law School. This will allow those on the stand to exit first and form a reception line where we hope to greet each one of you. We turn the time to Dean Smith. Those of you who know Jim well know that this is probably his favorite thing to receive awards and lots of attention. Um, I hope to make him extremely uncomfortable over the next couple of minutes. Uh, Jim is one of my dearest friends and a person I admire um, more than almost anybody on this planet. On April 17, 2009, then Academic Vice President of BYU, John S. Tanner, announced the appointment of Jim Rasband as the new dean of the J. Reuben Clark Law School. That same day, I received an email from a law professor friend at another law school who had seen the announcement, and he asked, is this good news for you? What is Rasband like? I replied, this is good news for me and for the law school. Jim is immensely popular among the faculty, even after serving as an associate dean. He's, he is just genuinely a great guy, funny, engaging, smart, the sort of person you want to dislike, but you can't because he's just too nice. In June 2009, Jim asked me to serve as his associate dean of faculty and curriculum uh, alongside Kiff Augustine Adams, who was serving as associate dean of research and academic affairs. At the time, I had no idea how much my life would be blessed by having the opportunity to serve with Jim and Kiff. While Jim is widely regarded for his incisive mind, his analytical ability, his excellent judgment, and unrivaled work, work ethic, those who know him best also praise his keen sense of duty to the university and the church and the graciousness with which he fulfills his administrative responsibilities. On one occasion during our service in the law school deanery, Jim was dealing with a particularly persistent person who was making what we viewed as unreasonable demands on the law school's administration. As we worked through the analysis of the demands, it was clear that we could lay out a case that would not only reject the demands, uh, but would cause this person some embarrassment uh, for their overreaching. 
In considering this case, Jim said, this would be devastating to him and we should not do that. It's important to ensure that he leaves our conversation with his dignity intact. During our time together, Jim changed the way I think about legal education and the way I think about BYU Law School. He has high standards for teaching, scholarship, and citizenship, and he was able to convey those standards to the faculty, administration, staff, and students of the law school with sweet boldness. Jim led BYU Law School from 2009 to 2016, perhaps the most challenging stretch in the history of legal education in the United States by expanding and improving every aspect of the law school. The most noticeable change during the RAS band years was already mentioned by Steve West. It was to the law building itself. The pedestrian bridge that used to connect the law school to the campus uh, over campus drive uh, was removed and the now iconic shape of the law building was fully revealed. Jim created a new student commons on the south end of the law building, a new trial courtroom and converted uh, library space to classrooms and remodeled almost every classroom in the building. But it's the Memorial Lounge, the feature that you encounter when you enter the law building now that most uh, impacts the experience of being at the law building. He brought light to the law school. He also reshaped the law school's curriculum, adding legislation and regulation to our first year curriculum and launching a number of law school clinics, including a law and entrepreneurship clinic, the Timpanogos Legal Center, the Family Law Clinic, and a negotiation and conflict resolution clinic, as well as various skills labs and other experiential learning experiences for our students. In addition, he created post-graduation fellowships for our students who are interested in public interest work. During his time as dean, over half of the faculty of the law school turned over, which is a remarkably uh, challenging environment to be in. But he oversaw this change and worked with those faculty and encouraged the hiring and development of our new faculty members. He increased the number of endowed scholarships by almost three times and the number of endowed professorships by, uh, by about 40%. Uh, in addition, he's done so many other things for the International Center for Law and Religion Study, including creating the International Advisory Council. Now, this list of accomplishments is woefully incomplete. I, I didn't really want to read the whole list to you, but it's breathtaking in its scope and ambition. All of us who were privileged to work at the law school during Jim, Jim's deanship recognized that this was a transformational uh, period of time. Nevertheless, although the law school made great strides under his leadership, when I think of his deanship, I do not think about the new faculty, new courses, new classrooms, or new programs. My time as his associate dean changed my life in, in more fundamental ways. About a year after becoming the dean of the law school, Jim was called as a stake president over Helaman Halls, and during his term of service, the church lowered the missionary age for both men and women. This important change in policy resulted in unprecedented missionary applications among BYU freshmen, and Jim could have easily been consumed either by his dean job or by his ecclesiastical responsibilities, but he managed to juggle both of these. It's amazing to me that he could accomplish so much as dean of the law school while working through this period. During this time, we continued to have three to four hour dean meetings, and Jim counseled with me on all manner of personal and professional concerns. Watching him over those five years, I was inspired to become a better teacher, a better colleague, a better husband, a better father, and a better friend. I will be forever grateful that I had the opportunity to serve with Jim Rasban. Jim, thank you for all you've done for the law school, for the J. Rubin Clark Law Society, and uh, most importantly to me, for me personally. I give you now Jim Rasband. <laughs> um, way too generous. And, um, you know, the, the truth is that that list were really things that others accomplished, and I just happened to be there. It is really wonderful tonight um, to be here with so many friends, both those who are here in this room 
and those who join us um, via live stream around the world. One of the great blessings of serving as the dean of the BYU Law School and on the Law Society's Executive Committee is that I've had the chance to meet so many of you. I am truly honored to have received um, this leadership award this evening. I know I am not deserving, um, but I'm always grateful if friendship and collegiality trumps um, critical analysis. And I'm really grateful for both Steve and Gordon in that respect. The truth is, as I said, that during my time as dean of the BYU Law School and now um, as part of the university administration, my primary contribution has been to bask in the reflected glory of colleagues and students' accomplishments. As some of you may have heard me say, social psychologists actually have a term for that sort of tag-along achievement. It's called berging, um, basking in the reflected glory of others until you begin to see those accomplishments as your own. So I'm all about berging, and it's a key talent um, for administrators who stop producing things on, on their own. The real praise truly tonight is deserved um, by Rebecca Van Eidert. Her work for immigrants and the sacrifice it entailed that was captured so well in Richard Sheffield's citation is a remarkable and a great example of what members of the Law Society can accomplish. Speaking of great examples, tonight I want to take just a second to particularly acknowledge um, former Arizona Chief Justice Charles Bud Jones, who passed away um, less than a month ago. Bud was an early international chair of the Law Society and did a lot to build both the Law Society and the BYU Law School. He was a true friend and mentor to many of us, and he will be missed. Finally, I am grateful to Tyler Holt and Bronson Arroyo. Their uh, musical number was, was beautiful, and that alone was surely um, worth being here this evening. So I'm humbled to have this opportunity to speak. I feel keenly um, how short I fall of the extraordinary group of women and men who have spoken at this fireside in the past. But nevertheless, I am grateful to have this opportunity to share a few thoughts. 45 years ago, on the very first day of classes at the J. Reuben Clark Law School, then university president, Dallin H. Oaks, gave an address. In it, he articulated what he described as six expectations for the law school. His fifth expectation related to the curriculum and manner of instruction, which he said, quote, should approach the law from a scholarly and objective point of view with the largest latitude in the matters being considered, close quote. And then he remarked, quote, despite the latitude that must be allowed for instruction in this law school, there are fundamental principles on which there is no latitude. We expect to have a vigorous examination of the legal principles governing the relationship between church and state under the Constitution, but no time for debate over the existence of God or man's ultimate accountability to him. There is ample latitude for examination of the responsibilities of a lawyer who is prosecuting or defending one of crime, but no room for debate over the wrongfulness of taking a life stealing, or bearing false witness." Close quote. The study of law, not just at BYU, but at any law school and continuing in law practice, acquaints us with the fact that interpreting text and law can be challenging, particularly where persons engage in the interpretive task from different experiences, backgrounds, and preferences. But the fact that language can have different meanings also must not obscure that there are certain fixed stars and immutable truths by which we can guide ourselves. This evening, I want to address the question how we can distinguish interpretive questions on which we should give wide latitude and what President Oaks described as fundamental principles on which there is no latitude. As President Oaks also noted, different rules stand on different footings. There is no democracy among legal rules. Some are more important than others. Thus, some rules are based on eternal principles of right and wrong or on basic tenets of our Constitution. Others are rooted in the soil of men's reasoning, soil that may be washed away by the torrent of human custom or the current of advancing thought, leaving the rule without support or justification. In furtherance of their devotion to the rule of law, 
the graduates of this law school, and I'd add parenthetically, all of the members of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society, continuing the quote, should have minds sufficiently bright and consciences sufficiently sensitive to distinguish between rules grounded on morality and those grounded solely on precedent or tradition. Rules based on tradition may be assailed when their supporting reasons have lost touch with the soil of human need, but rules based on morality must be defended at all costs since they are rooted in the eternal principles of right revealed by God our Father." Close quote. So how do we distinguish the rules that are essential, the rules that are fundamental and unalterable, from the rules rooted in the soil of men's reasoning that can be washed away by the torrent of human custom or advancing thought? Discerning this line is no small moral task. I don't claim to discern this boundary with precision, and part of my point this evening will be that we should be cautious in assuming we can but I do claim that fundamental boundaries exist. More broadly and equally fundamentally, I want to consider the principles that should guide our engagement with this line drawing exercise. The effort to distinguish the essential from the non-essential is an age old task. Stoic philosophers long ago divided human endeavor into three categories, good, evil, and adiaphora which is a Greek term, adiaphora, meaning things indifferent. During the Protestant Reformation, the reformers argued endlessly about what belonged in the category of adiaphora. Was it essential or indifferent if the priest wore a surplice, if the communion table was level with the congregation or elevated, if communicants knelt or stood for communion, if worshipers sang hymns, and so forth. Great debates raged about the boundaries of adiaphora in a properly reformed church. Now, I have to confess that references to the Greek uh, when I don't know um, Greek or to Stoics when I'm not a trained philosopher are a bit risky. As lawyers, you'll both share my trepidation and uh, my willingness um, to venture into areas where I have little formal training. Um, it surely is the life of a litigator. I, so I was first introduced to this concept of adiaphora and that terminology years ago by John Tanner when we were serving together in the BYU administration and we were trying to consider the application of the capacious boundaries of BYU's academic freedom statement. John pointed out how often the scriptures use the language, it mattereth not. And as I will discuss later, in many, many cases that is surely true. Although the precise debates that animated the reformers during the Protestant Reformation no longer generate much energy, there is still plenty of energy, some appropriate and some inappropriate, for engaging in the boundary drawing exercise of distinguishing the essential from the adiaphora, or things indifferent. In my judgment, grasping the nature of this challenge is a task for which lawyers by their training are particularly well equipped. As a framework for considering the line between essential and adiaphora, let's return to President Oak's address on the first day of classes where he said that, quote, we expect to have a vigorous examination of the legal principles governing the relationship between church and state under the Constitution, but no time for debate over the existence of God, close quote. Doctrinally, God's existence is not a matter for indifference. One cannot simultaneously claim belief in the restored gospel and indifference on this matter. Note, however, that belief in the existence of God is in some sense adiaphora if the test is national citizenship rather than membership in the restored church of Jesus Christ. This distinction is conceptually important when we operate in both worlds, but presents a challenging tension to which I'll return. What else can we say confidently is not part of adiaphora for a believer. Immediately, we might add belief in the doctrine of the Savior's atoning sacrifice and the two great commandments set forth in the Savior's response to the lawyer's question, which is the greatest commandment in the law. Quote, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets." Close quote. 
to take one more illustrative step. We could add the Ten Commandments to the essential list. In fact, we could continue this exercise all evening, identifying other doctrines and commandments and adding them to that essential core. And as we added items to the core, however, at some point, and it would not be the same point for everyone in this room, we would hit upon issues where we would disagree whether the teaching or practice was essential or adiaphora. To take a common example, consider Sabbath observance. We might all concur about the essential nature of the command in Exodus to, quote, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, close quote. But would we all agree on a list of permitted and prohibited Sabbath activities? How do we interpret the command to keep the Sabbath day holy? What does it mean that on the Sabbath day thou shalt not do any work? What about the ox in the mire? What about essential health and public services? And to place this in the context of civil society, if we can discern the essentials of Sabbath observance, what if any part of those essentials is appropriate to demand of our fellow citizens? If we can settle upon the appropriate meaning and scope of Sabbath work, should our conclusion be imposed on fellow citizens, for example, in the form of blue laws? This same interpretive challenge of discerning the boundaries of the essential and adiaphora emerges in the application of doctrine after doctrine. Even in the two great commandments, we are faced with the interpretive question of exactly how love of God and love of our neighbor should manifest themselves. Ask any parent or friend about what love demands, and they will surely tell you of the struggle for discernment. I hope it is clear that distinguishing the essential from the adiaphora is not merely a theoretical exercise, but instead the stuff of our everyday lives. If we struggle with a particular doctrine of the gospel, can we simply relegate that doctrine to the adiaphora? How much room for disagreement is there? Is separating the adiaphora from the essential just a matter of personal preference, or is there a real line to be discerned? I'm committed to the principle that there are, in fact, real lines to be discerned. I've mentioned just a few of them already, but my project tonight isn't to draw all those lines. Instead, I'd like to consider some principles by which we can approach this discernment challenge. I discuss first a familiar but important idea. Distinguishing the essential from adiaphora is partly about distinguishing principle from application. Here again, the law of the Sabbath is instructive, and to be clear, my primary concern is not the Sabbath. Rather, my sense is that the familiarity for all of us of Sabbath boundary questions will help illustrate the conceptual framework that I hope can then apply to challenging doctrinal, political, social policy boundary questions that may weigh on each of us. As President Russell M. Nelson said in a conference talk a few years ago, quote, in my much younger years, I studied the work of others who had compiled lists of things to do and things not to do on the Sabbath. It wasn't until after that after that, I learned from the scriptures that my conduct and my attitude on the Sabbath constitute a sign between me and my Heavenly Father. With that understanding, I no longer needed lists of do's and don'ts. When I had to make a decision whether or not an activity was appropriate for the Sabbath, I simply asked myself, what sign do I want to give to God? That question made my choices about the Sabbath day crystal clear." Close quote. Not only for the Sabbath day, but for any commandment, it is simply impossible to list all the potential applications. The value of focusing on principles is that once internalized, the principle allows us to adapt to a wide range of questions and challenges. Principles have staying power, whereas applications can, in President Oak's words, lose touch with the soil of human need. Although I fear it is disciplinary arrogance. Um, I'm in the right group because I believe legal training equips us well to perceive the difference between principles and application. Starting in the first year of law school, there's a relentless focus on thinking about core theory and considering different hypotheticals that apply to those theories. Take, for example, the study of tort law. The goal is not to turn everyone into personal injury lawyers. Rather, the goal is to have students think about concepts like unreasonable risk, causation, and the scope of an individual's responsibility in society. 
Similarly, the purpose of one's property law course is not to make sure students can write up a mortgage or a lease, but to have them think about the nature of ownership. What makes something property? What limits can society place on our use of property? And in contracts, the goal is not primarily to teach students how to write contracts, but to have them think about why some agreements are binding, but others might not be. Why it matters when someone takes action and reliance on the promise of another, and so forth. President Oaks, in his address on the first day of classes at BYU Law, emphasized that the best legal training focuses on theory and principle. Here's what he said, quote, the half-life of a legal concept, even in these challenging times, is measured in centuries, not academic years. As legal historians can testify, many of the, most imp many of the important problems and controversies of our day are just recreations under different labels of problems encountered by successive generations from centuries past. <clears throat> a legal training that is predominantly theoretical is best able to equip students with the principles and skills they can apply throughout shifting circumstances of the next half century." Close quote. Thus, the goal of much of the study of law is not primarily to create specific expertise, but to teach principles that will allow students to handle the multitude of different challenges that will emerge in the practice of law or simply in the course of life. And of course, one of those challenges is distinguishing principle from application and the essential from adiaphora. This is not to say that all application is adiaphora. Think about the word of wisdom. The crucial principle is that our body is a temple, and understanding that principle can answer so many questions about how we ought to treat our body. But we still do have some applications, alcohol, tea, coffee, that are not matters of indifference or adiaphora. It's not surprising that when one listens to the leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it is evident that their talks focus primarily on principles rather than on application. Their focus is on the essential. This focus on teaching essential principles rather than application has some other salient benefits. It is a powerful symbol of trust. It allows us not to be commanded in all things, but to instead be anxiously engaged in good causes by our own free will and choice. Teaching principles also promotes the exercise of moral agency. We are free to act for ourselves in applying the essential principle to particular situations. If we are trying to discern the boundary between the essential and adiaphora, focusing on principles seems the wisest course. Now, we often teach this in the negative by pointing to the Sabbath practices of the scribes and the Pharisees at the time of Christ. Recall how the scribes and Pharisees famously constructed fences around the Mosaic Law to ensure that the command not to work on the Sabbath was followed, for example, various detailed categories of work were defined, including how many steps one could take, how many letters could be written, and so forth. The Savior famously condemned this approach, healing the sick and plucking and eating heads of grain on the Sabbath and teaching that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Still, I think sometimes we may be too facile in our criticism of the scribes and Pharisees for their fence building. It can be wisdom to build personal fences around commandments we wish to keep. Walking to the edge of danger is rarely wise. The Savior himself proposed fences with respect to the commandment against murder, enjoining that whosoever is angry without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And also, he did so with respect to adultery, enjoining looking on a woman to lust after her. In our own efforts, to live what is essential, we may construct protective fences. In doing so, however, we need to be mindful that our fence is not the equivalent of the underlying principle or law. And thus, we should not insist that others build their barricade in precisely the same place. That was the real error of the scribes and the Pharisees. It can be so tempting to assume that the boundary between essential and adiaphora mirrors our preferences. That which we regard as essential is essential for everyone else, and that which we regard as a matter of indifference must be a matter of indifference for all. Here, the admonitions to judge not in Matthew and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God in Micah seem particularly critical. If our neighbor's application of a command is different than our application, it is not a cause for judgment. This is not to say that any behavioral choice is, accept is an acceptable application of the underlying principle. 
The key concept is one of accountability. We are surely accountable for our own demarcation between the essential and the audiophora, and that should be enough to occupy our full attention. Understanding that application choices are statements of personal accountability teaches a related point. Because discerning the boundary between essential and audiophora can be challenging and controversial, we often want to enlist others to our cause. If only the prophet or another leader would just give us a talk affirming our preferred application of a doctrinal principle. Stated another way, we want our choices to be affirmed as being on the do list rather than the don't list. This sort of capture the leader or sometimes just capture the preferred talk is a temptation for all of us, and I've certainly participated. But ultimately, we are still accountable to the Lord for the boundary we draw and the application of the principle we pursue. Insisting that our demarcation of the audiophora is public, be publicly affirmed is, in a sense, a request that the application of others be publicly condemned. How much better for all of us to charitably understand and humbly consider when others apply a principle differently and to instead focus on our own accountability. Another approach we sometimes employ to avoid hard questions about the boundary between essential and audiophora is to reduce the size of the essential so that almost any doctrine and policy is a matter of indifference. Recall my earlier effort to set forth just a few core doctrines that could be categorized as essential. The existence of God, the Savior's atoning sacrifice, the two great commandments to love God with all of thy heart, might, mind, and strength, and to love thy neighbor as thyself, and the Ten Commandments. Visually, um, one can imagine, and I think you have to imagine because I don't have a PowerPoint slide. I decided to forego PowerPoint because they tend to look like home movies when I do them. But visually, imagine a vast outer circle representing the audiophora. And then at the center of that larger circle, four inner concentric circles identifying these essentials. As I suggested earlier, additional essential doctrines could be added to expand the interior concentric circles. The covenants we make with our Heavenly Father are an example. What happens, though, when an essential principle or doctrine may not align with one of our political or policy preferences? As I suggested before, one temptation is to ignore this possibility and uncritically assume that our preferences align perfectly with the essential. Another risk is that we will simply reduce the area of what is essential until our preference sits comfortably outside the inner circle and within the broader boundary of audiophora as a matter of indifference. An example of this might be the idea that the only essential truth is God's love and that everything else is audiophora. This has some appeal because God's love for us and the two great commandments that we love Him and love our neighbor is indeed an essential baseline principle from which so many important and faithful applications can be derived. The risk, however, is that if love is the one essential, the er principle, the other commandments can be relegated as audiophora. Yet the Savior was clear that on the two great commandments, quote, hang all the law and the prophets, close quote. He also said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Thus the Savior invested the principle of love with essential subsidiary principles and applications. This makes sense because the commandments themselves are a manifestation of God's love in the form of information about how to live joyfully. What is critical, I think, is not to relegate the commandments to the adiaphora, to the indifferent. If the commandments are matters of indifference, the Savior's atoning sacrifice is irrelevant. Mercy would not need to satisfy the demands of justice. It would be no small irony if Christ's teachings about love were understood to vitiate His greatest act of love, His sacrifice to atone for our sins, on the assumption that He unnecessarily paid a price that justice did not require. So discerning the precise boundaries of the essential and the audiophora is a lifetime project. Indeed, I'm quite confident we won't discern its full boundaries during our lifetime. For as Paul said, quote, for now, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity." Close quote. If we can't discern the boundary precisely, I hope that tonight I've been able 
to be clear that there are indeed essential and eternal truths discernible to all who seek them. Indeed, the most precious truths are known most fully by the Spirit. But even if the essential is most perceptively discerned by the Spirit, I hope also that I've hit upon a few useful principles to guide our effort um, in our effort to study it out in our minds, this boundary between the essential and the adiaphora. Because drawing boundaries is such an important function of our exercise of agency, and because the effort can be so challenging, and because even when we properly discern what is essential, we fail to consistently live in accordance with the truths we know, Paul's admonition to charity is critical. I tried to capture this idea in the title of my remarks tonight, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. This language actually comes from BYU's academic freedom policy, which makes what I believe is a noble effort to give concrete notice of the terms of the boundary between the essential and adiaphora, at least for the academic um, task of faculty at BYU. As it must, the document describes the boundaries with reference to principles rather than precise application, concluding that a limit on individual faculty academic freedom is, quote, reasonable when the faculty behavior expression seriously and adversely affects the university mission or the church, close quote. The document provides three examples, including, quote, expression with students or in public that contradicts or opposes rather than analyzes or discusses fundamental, there's that word again, fundamental church doctrine or policy, close quote. No finding of a violation is appropriate unless a faculty member can fairly be considered to be aware that the expression violates the standards. As one of the persons charged with applying this principle at the university, I can tell you it is a humbling and daunting role. Fortunately, the occasions when we need to engage this boundary analysis are truly rare at the university. But when we do, um, the Academic Freedom Policy Council's quote, the faculty administration and the board should work together in a spirit of love, trust, and goodwill. The faculty rightly assumes its work is presumptively free from restraint, but at the same time, it assumes an obligation of dealing with sensitive issues sensitively and with the civility that becomes believers. BYU rightly expects LDS faculty to be faithful and other faculty to be respectful of the church and BYU's mission. Thus, both the university's governing bodies and the faculty obligate themselves to use their respective academic freedom responsibly within the context of a commitment to the gospel. As Elder B. H. Roberts said, in essentials let there be unity, in non-essentials liberty, and in all things charity." Close quote. So this posture seems exactly right for BYU, and it articulates a principle that applies well beyond academic confines. I join in the hope that in essentials we will find unity and in non-essentials liberty, but because the essential and the non-essential adiaphora can be so challenging to discern, particularly at the margins and with those whose values or faith differ from our own, I hope that in all instances we'll exhibit charity. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for this opportunity we've had this evening to gather as friends and fellow members of the Law Society and to be taught and instructed by Brother Rasman. We're thankful for his insights and for the message of inspiration that he shared with us about how to discern and live the essentials in life. Please bless us, Father, that we might remember what we've been taught and how we felt that it will influence us for good as we go forward uh, and share what, we've, share what we've learned with others to help lift and strengthen those around us. We're grateful for the Law Society as an organization and for its mission statement and the many opportunities that it gives us to to strengthen each other and to be a force for good within our circles of influence. Please bless us as an organization throughout the world that we will be guided and directed by thy spirit. And at this time now, we pray for thy spirit to be with us 
the remainder of this evening that we might return to our homes in safety and enjoy the time that we have together. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.